My name is Neil Cummins. I'm former bodyguard to John Abraham, a standover man, and I was also Australia's Most Wanted in 2017. My childhood actually was, um, it was pretty good. It was pretty decent, actually. Um, you know, my father owned nightclubs, ran nightclubs since he was 21. Uh, my mother, well, she worked in a hospital looking after hearts and all that kind of stuff. I never went without, but um, I never told my parents what I used to get up to, you know what I mean? Because the guys I used to hang out with were, um, would steal cars, you know, do a bit of pot, um, hang out at the shops, do a bit of gang fighting, you know what I mean? So I'd always say that, you know, I'm going down the park to hang out, but it was always to go and rob a car, probably, you know what I mean? Um, my goal was to be a footballer when I was younger. Um, didn't pan out. Did a bit of boxing uh, with my mates. Um, but yeah, I had a good childhood. It wasn't too bad. My relationship with my parents was mostly um, my dad I was close to uh, because I was always with him and because of the football and the soccer kind of uh, thing. My mother, um, not so close um, to the extent of like it was with my dad. But more, I was closer to my grandparents. Uh, they were a lot more like a, a father and mother figure to me. So I was always with them every day. Uh, when I was in school, in high school, uh, 13 years old, I was giving out tickets to my dad's clubs, to my mates, you know what I mean? And because of my dad and he was well known there, I could get in at the age of 13, 14, I was going clubbing. So um, that's how I, I got into that kind of scene of wanting to be, I actually wanted to be a DJ when I was fucking younger. But uh, you know, I was shit at fucking, doing turntables. So, um, but now I got to see everything that my, you know, my dad didn't really know the people who they were, but I knew there was somebody who my dad used to hang out with. Cause I was always told to leave the table when they turned up or I was told to get out the room or whatever it was. So I knew, you know, these people were somebody. I moved to Sydney, to Australia, yeah, when I was 18 years old, uh, my, my mother moved because they were divorced, me and my dad, uh, to my dad and um, I moved over here with my stepfather and my mother. And um, yeah, I just treated it at the first 12 months as a holiday. Um, didn't really like it, didn't make much friends. I didn't actually know that everyone was anti-English over here at the time I moved out. And um, uh, yeah, I found it awkward to come out here. And then my parents, well, my mother uh, moved and went to Perth and left me when I was, um, I think I was only just 19, 10 and 20. And I lived in Wollongong by myself. Um, it affected me in a, in, a, in a big way because I felt that I've just come over 15,000 miles. I really didn't want to come over. My dad forced me to come over because he thought I was going to end up in jail um, if I stayed over there. So I've come over and then all of a sudden they packed up, wanted to go to Perth. And I just didn't want to do it. And, um, you know, I, I thought, well, I've just come with here. I'm not going to fucking go over there. And she just left. And there was no, like, care factor. And um, I had to you know, kind of grow up with no parents, um, which was hard, you know what I mean? Because I had no one to talk to. You know, I had stepsisters at the time. Um, and, um, you know, they went with, they went with my parents because they were only young. But... Yeah, I found it very hard, especially when, you know, you can see everyone that you hang around with, all, all your friends and all like that, you've just made. They've got families, Christmas times would come. Um, I'd have, you know, birthdays. I was in hospital for a lot um, stuff and there was no one there for me. So yeah, it was hard growing up, especially in Wollongong. I gave up football. Um, I got an injury and I, I, I thought, well, after that, I just didn't want to, I was getting over Wollongong really. And um, I went back to doing a bit of, uh, boxing and I went hit the gym a lot and I must admit this I remember the security guard who I used to know in the Westfield and he, he he always talked to me and he just he was the person who got me on the gear and that honestly transformed my life because I went from being a soccer player skinny wrench to then all of a sudden finding out what this could actually do and when I exploded my confidence was just out the roof you know what I mean? I was already a confident person, but when I started taking the gear, I just went, fuck. You know what I mean? And then he, he led me in a way was, I'll get you a job doing this, because he knew I could fucking look after myself. And then I started working um, the doors, and I done I worked for Westfields and Miranda, but then I, I got my first um, nightclub gig at home nightclub. And um, yeah, that's all started from there. I've, I've, got, I've never been a person to shy away from it. I'm honest about it, yeah? Um, I do still use it, and 
I don't get it when someone turns around and says, when they're on it, they get roid rage because when I'm on it, I'm fucking calm as fuck. When I'm off it, I'm losing it. You know what I mean? Because it's that it's that fixation that you want because it knows you know what it can do to your body. You know that it makes you feel good about yourself. And when you're off it, that's when you're fucking losing it. So um, yeah, I've you know I, I use it. Um, I've got no problem with saying that. Um, I used to abuse it. And there was a time when I abused it, and you know I'd, I'd put a top on. It, if it was too small and uh, not small, but big on me and loose. And even though I was like at the time about 100, 130 kilos. And if I, if I, if it was loose on me, I'd rip it off, throw it in the bin and then inject another five mils into me because I thought I was losing size quickly. But yeah, it was a head fuck. I went, you know what I mean? But now I've controlled it. I don't know how to control it all. John Abraham, um, is probably the most, he doesn't like to be called, an underworld figure, his businessman. But at the end of the day, the Abrahams from his brother, Sam Abraham, the old Fadi Abraham, Mick Abraham, they're the most well-known underworld figures probably in, in Sydney, if not Australia. So that's who John Abraham is. He, he owned 14 to 16 nightclubs uh, over Sydney, mostly King's Cross and Oxford Street. Um, very good businessman. And um, yeah, very powerful man. When I first met John, because I was working on, his, on DCMs at the time, and I hadn't, I'd, I'd got, my, in my head who fixation what John looked like. I've never met him in person. So when you're standing out on the door and it's your first night on DCMs and that you know that John's got, you've been told John comes down to make sure everything's running properly. And then all of a sudden, everyone nudges each other and sees the Range Rover coming down Oxford Street. And I'm, I, I must admit, I was sweating. You know what I mean? This is it now, I'm gonna meet this fucking person who everyone fucking goes on about. I'd already be prior to that, cause I've been working in the cross, had run-ins with his brother but I'd never met this person. So when he got out the car, I didn't know what he looked like. So obviously you're thinking, because of this man who's got so much power, the first person I locked eyes on was Tongan Sam. And I thought that's John Abraham, because someone who's fucking big, got presence about him, I didn't know it was the guy fucking in front of him. So when he walked towards me to shake my hand, I wasn't ready for this guy, you know what I mean? So I put my hand out, yeah, yeah, who are you? But I was waiting for fucking um, Tongue and Sam, thinking this is John. So when I was shaking hands with uh, John, not knowing, he turned around to me, oh, is that all you got? And I said, mate, yeah, and he goes, I'm John. And I went, oh, and I, I was actually lost for words. Shook his hand, walked off. I felt like a dick, you know what I mean? Tongue and Sam came past, put, put his arm on my, I remember he put his arm on my shoulder, said, how are you going? Uh, nice to meet you. And they all walked up and went up the stairs. After that, I just went to everyone, fuck you, Joel could have told me who the fuck he looked like, you know what I mean? Because I didn't know he was going to be like five foot eight, you know what I mean? I worked my way up the ladder with John, you know what I mean? I wasn't the, um, the person who asked, I want to be a bodyguard, I want to be a bodyguard. Um, he's seen it himself, you know what I mean? Like working on his doors, looking after uh, all his clubs from Lady Lux, DCMs, uh, Havana, um, Dragonfly. You know what I mean? He, he, to me, I felt like he tested me in, in situations to see if I could handle myself. And to me, working on DCMs was a test, you know what I mean? Because the, the amount of people I had to deal with uh, who were known people, I didn't back down. So when DCMs was about, it was before DCMs closed, I was doing a few little walks with him. He'd asked me to come with him. But when DCMs actually finished, that's when he says, what do you want to do? Tell, he, he came to me and he says, tell me what you want to do. And I told him straight to his face, I want to walk with you now. That's it, I want to walk. He said, done, that's it, you, you're there. So one night when I was at DCMs, um, there was a drive-by, um, but what they did before the actual drive-by happened, they did um, a practice run the week before. So when they, when they did the practice run, they stopped off on Oxford Street, uh, just outside um, Hungry Jack's. Uh, there was a car pulled up, um, I remember watching it, there's five guys in it, they drove slowly towards the front door and um, leaned out the window and pointed their fingers at us. And they just kind of done the shots with bang, bang, you know what I mean? We just thought, whatever, you fucking idiots, fuck off, and this and that went. The next week, it actually happened and the same car came past, but it was all in slow motion, you know what I mean? Um, one weird factor on that night was that I don't, I never do is the bollards for the outside the club I decided to bring them in uh, about 15 minutes early before they actually did the drive-by. And I don't usually do that. 
So I came out, I thought, fuck it, there's no one here. It's pretty dead night tonight. I'll bring the bollards towards the door. Because I used to stand, if you, if you know DCMs, there's a hairdresser that used to be next door to DCMs. I used to stand right by the, the main door for, these, uh, for the uh, hairdressers where the bollards were. I brought them all the way through to the main door of DCM. So we stood there. So I don't think they were actually no planning that I would have moved. So when they came past, and it was funny when they came past, I see the car, but you know when you it, when something you know that something's gonna happen, you can't speak, you can't get it to come out of your mouth, your reaction is just fucking slow. If they came past, and this time instead of the fingers, you just seen everything, you know what I mean? The guns, everyone, that there was there was hands out that, that window. And there were eight bullets, I think eight or nine bullets went, hit the, the, the door of the hairdressers where I was standing. You know, the, a few people got hit coming down the stairs, one at the outside Gloria Jeans, um, and then they just sped off. And it was just like, a, everything, as I said, it was just slow motion. Um, you know, I, I, was, I remember looking at myself, checking if I'd been shot. Um, there was two, two patrons down on the floor, one, down, one guy down at the um, Gloria Jeans, and the windows were just shattered where I was. Um, but you know what? Out of all that, it didn't hit me. It, it it only hits me now that what happened then. You know what I mean? Not back then. It was like, it's, it's weird to say that. But that was the most, I'd say that was the most out of all of it. I wouldn't actually know. I'd say there was another bit back in 2010 where I got followed home when I was living in Neutral Bay. And uh, as I was getting out of the car, they shot out my car. Um, and they put six bullets in the car. Um, uh, and then they just drove off. You know what I mean? It, it was, they got, and I used to go home different directions all the time. You know what I mean? Because I was always paranoid. Not just with people from gangs or whatever. I was paranoid. Didn't want police to follow me. You know what I mean? To know where I lived. I was very secretive where I lived. Um, so that was another thing. But, you know, that was in my unit. I was already out of my car. And I heard the echoes of the uh, of the gunshots when I'd already got to the front door of the apartment. So it was like they were just trying to scare me. It wasn't trying to hit me. Um, the other the other time was when John was in a meeting in King's Cross, and um, he was downstairs in Dreamgirls, and um, there was a guy outside Dreamgirls. I remember I was I used to stand outside while he had his meetings, and this guy just kept walking up and down, up and down outside the the venue, and then all of a sudden he unzipped his jacket, and I thought, fuck, you know. What are you doing? And then all of a sudden, he just, seeing that there was no security at the front door, and he just opened it more, and he just pulled the gun out. And as he pulled the gun out, he ran for the door. I just ran at him, ran at him, and if you don't know, if the stairs go down to Dream Girls, there's glass on the on the side as you go down, on the side of the wall. I grabbed him, the gun went onto the, the, onto the wall like this. I held his hand there, and he was trying to point it at me, and I just kept headbutting him, headbutting him till he dropped it. He dropped the gun, and then I just threw him down the stairs, and. But you know, it's the adrenaline is that the fact that if you don't think what you're doing, you know what I mean? Like it's only maybe, as I said, years later, you have all these recollections of what you did. Should I have done that? Shit, what a dickhead I was, you know what I mean? But yeah, that's, the stabbing was just a, you know, I got outside DCMs, um, the, the laneway, um, the guy came out the back door and he was kicked out. I went down the back door to see who he was. And as I was coming down, he ran at me I didn't know what was going on because at that time we didn't have um, radios to know what was going on. So when I see someone coming out, I don't know what the fuck's going on. And then as I ran out to him, I, I kind of tackled him as we were on the floor. He stabbed me at the at the bottom of my leg. Um, not sure, like I think it was glass. I didn't even go back to check. I didn't even know I was stabbed. Dave Freeman at the time seen all the blood coming down from my leg. But um, yeah, that's mostly all the times that I've had incidents. You know what I mean? I was a target because everyone knew that how close I was to John. Uh, I was a target for one because um, I looked after his venues. I was always by his side. Um, I was his eyes. You know what I mean? Like, it, don't get me wrong, there was other people doing that too. But I was under the radar with a lot of people. You know what I mean? Like, so they just thought I was a doorman. But a lot of people didn't know that. Yeah, I was a doorman on a Saturday, but sometimes on a Friday, I'd be walking around with John. Sometimes on a Sunday, I'd be having a meeting with John to say like, this is what's going on in the scene. You know what I mean? So people trusted me and I'd find out things, get it back to the people who, who would sort the things out. So, and then it got back, as I said, that drive-by, two weeks prior to that, the, the, the gang that were, did the drive-by pulled me up in Randwick uh, when I had my five-month-old five baby uh, daughter with me in Randwick Shopping Centre. And it was about 8.30 at night. I just went to the shops out of, just randomly went there and needed some stuff. Thought I'd go take my daughter with me. 
And as I was in the, the Randwick shopping centre, I seen these, these boys from this other gang coming down the stairs, the escalators. I seen them, they seen me. I didn't think nothing of it. I didn't think they would do anything because I had my daughter in the car of a satchel. Um, and as I was going, I got my shopping, I went down back to the car park, noticed that they were following me. I thought, fuck, what am I going to do? I've got, my, I've got my daughter with me here. Do I, do I take her off? Do I put her on the floor? Do I, do I hold her, just take the beating? What am I going to do here? So I, I was kind of panicking. And as I got to the car park, I kind of, they, they called me out. I turned back and they said, what, you're walking around all pieced up? I said, what the fuck are you talking about? They said, they actually thought that my kid was a piece. And I said, come on, bro. And they, and they went, yeah, you're fucking like this. And as I went like that, I said, bro, I got a fucking, I got a baby. Lucky I went like that, because he had it out. He had it out. Knowing that, because there was no cameras at all. And I just said, what, you're gonna fucking shoot me with a kid? And luckily, one of them fucking manned up and said, fuck, put it away. Next time, Neil, like that to me. And I think that's why they did the drive-by. I went to work and I would have took a bullet. I was going, tonight's the night, I'm gonna take a bullet. You know what I mean? I was there. When he had people saying they were gonna put a hit on him, I was ready to go in front of him. You know what I mean? But then my loyalty to me means that you've always got my back, you'll do anything for me. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter. As I said, I showed my loyalty by losing friends. You know, because I'm working, they're telling me you shouldn't be working with John, you're a fucking idiot. You know what I mean? Fuck off. I, I lost my mother. You know what I mean? My mother, like she, when she came back to Wollongong, and she found out that I was working for John. She told me if I don't leave John, that I'm dead to her. That's what was her words. And she said, I told her to, my, uh, to her face, I'm gonna stay with John. So she says, well, leave my house, you are dead. And that's how it's been since 2008. I've not spoken to her because of them words. You know, that's, that's how much I was there for him. You know what I mean? I don't know myself, I can't speak for him. You know what I mean? I, yeah, I'm not saying that he wasn't loyal to me, but what I'm saying is me personally to him, I would have give up everything for John. And I did, you know what I mean? I, I stuck my neck out for everything. There's a lot of things he doesn't know that I actually did. I let other people take the, the glory for it. You know what I mean? So put it this way, people have asked, was it the money? If it was the money, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't be waiting for John. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't, I'm fucking like other people were on, but I was there because I wanted to be there for him. You know what I mean? I loved working for him and his family. You know what I mean? I had a good relationship. At the end of the day, he was my boss, but he was, he was like, it was like a brother I'd never had. You know what I mean? And Fadi was the same. You know what I mean? My, my relationship with Fadi was unbelievable, and it still is. Um, but I, I would turn up for work because I wanted to. Um, yeah, it was the fact that there was respect there for the family, and he'd taken me in, how, how he did. But the thing is, as I said, I worked my way up to get that. When I first met him, I told myself, I want Tongan Sam's job. I want that, I want to be that. You know what I mean? Um, and when I got it, I wasn't gonna lose it. But I, I was always um, curious who was in our circle, who, which ones were the, the reals, which ones were the fakes. And so that's why back when I came back to about two, 2008, I stood back from walking by his side to, to actually analyze who was in our group because I didn't trust him, you know what I mean? I actually didn't, I didn't trust people. And that's the, one of the reasons why I got out because, you know, there was times when, um, you know, I was getting information and I didn't ask for it, but I was getting it and um, I was giving it to them and then they thought I was an informer. But, you know, because I'm getting information, how are you getting it? Well, I'm just getting it because, you know, fuck, maybe I've got a bit of respect or something like that. And they took go to John and say, you've got to get Neil out. So these were the people that I was like, I'm fucking walking with you, but you want me out? I know why you want me out, because the fact is if I'm out, you have John, you can put your arm around John and you can tell him what to do. But when I'm here, I can see what you're doing and I'll fucking stop it. You know what I mean? When John used to go home, so this was John's routine. He'd turn up at the club every weekend, come to the cross. He would analyze everything, make his presence felt, um, go back to the clubs, make sure they're all running properly, have a bit of fun, go home safely. Once he went home, everyone in that circle played up, except me. And I can fucking say that, and I truthfully say that, and I don't give a fuck who's listening. I didn't, I watched them all play up. And this is when they all fucking used to go, fuck, we gotta get Neil out. Because when they came to like, John's gone home, I could see what you are doing, you're ripping them off. You're doing that. What the fuck are you dealing fucking coke in here for? You know what I mean? And I did it, I fucking, you know, I didn't, I walked into the kitchen one day and they were all fucking lining up with their coke and I just fucking threw it all on the floor and I told them if you don't get out, I'll knock you all out. That's, I didn't care who I was hurting. 
You know what I mean? As I said, I've stood up to Sam before for John. And that was fucking hard. You know what I mean? That was very hard to do. But that's my loyalty. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm John's boy. I always will be John's boy. When I was um, uh, put to Australia's Most Wanted, um, I actually didn't even know. And I remember just getting a phone call off the Daily Telegraph. It was on a Sunday. And they rang me up and they wanted the story. And I thought they were ringing me because at the time, all the Abrahams were in the papers for the Dubai issue. And I thought, listen, I've got nothing to say. Don't want to say nothing. They said, no, it's about you. Um, tomorrow you're going to be all over the papers and the news. Um, you're a wanted person. I said, mm, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. They said, no, well, we're running it. So we need to, we want your story. Otherwise, we're just going to run it. And I said, what are you running? He said, but you're Australia's most wanted fugitive. And I said, but you've just fucking caught me. And then they brought up something about what it was about. As soon as they brought it up, I just went, I'm not talking anymore. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. So I remember I rang my fucking, um, I was panicking. And I remember I rang up my solicitor and I got through to him on his phone and he was on a fucking cruise boat. And I said, bro, I need you. And he goes, well, I'm not back for two days. I said, well, what the fuck do you want me to do? I said, they're saying this. He said, that's bullshit. I said, it's not bullshit, man. He said, it's bullshit. He didn't believe it. He said, I had a full of shit. So I said, he said, go, you do your things, enjoy yourself, you'll be all right. Fucking that night, I'm panicking. The next day, I'm splattered over every paper. Every paper, front page, it was like five, uh, five long inside the papers. News, fucking Channel 9, Channel 7. I even hit the fucking papers back in UK. That's how much it was. And then I fucking freaked. I didn't want to leave my house. I rang my solicitor again. I said, have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it because he's on the fucking uh, thing. I said, look at your fucking internet. He's seen it. Then he just went to me, fuck. He says, get in a hotel, hide, and fucking um, don't let anyone see you. By that time, I've already been given up. You know what I mean? My neighbors, someone had given me up in my neighbors. Um, luckily, I wasn't there at the time. Rapid had turned off, gone through my house. That's in Nerskin Park where I was. Um, so I, I was in the Novotel, and I remember walking into Book to go to the Novotel. And you know when you walk into a Novotel reception area, and on top of the fucking, on top of the fucking lifts, you've got two plasma fucking tellies. I walk in and I've got my kids with me and I, I fucking look in and I thought, please just give, give, give them cash. Let me just get in that fucking lift without no one seeing me because there was people waiting to get in. And as I got in, just them walking and pressed the button to go up, Channel 7 News comes on and my face comes on straight away. And I'm going, fuck, fuck. I just said to my kids, get in the fuck up. I pushed them in, just get, get in, get in. Went upstairs, I'm up there, I'm freaking out, I couldn't sleep. I, I need to, I, I said, I'm giving myself up tomorrow. I said, I need, I need clothes, I need to get some clothes from me. So I sent, I remember that I sent at the time, I sent um, my missus back to, uh, to Kmart, to go Kmart, get me something to, I didn't want to look like a fucking Eshe. You know what I mean? I was, the way I was dressed, I, was, I looked like a dick if I'd give myself up at Bearwood Police Station. So I, um, she went and got me something, uh, came back, and um, I got changed, I couldn't sleep. I'm telling him, I spoke to my solicitor again. I said, what time do I meet you? He says, 10 o'clock outside Bearwood Police Station. I said, all right. So I went down early for breakfast the next day at the buffet in Novotel. And without thinking, I just thought, you know, I'll go down there early, no one will be around. Every fucking um, uh, breakfast table at the Daily Telegraph with my fucking, my face on it. You know what I mean? I'm going, oh my God, I can't even sit, can't eat, can't do nothing. I said, now I've got to go upstairs. I ordered breakfast to come to my room, left it at the front door, got that. Then I went. Um, and I freaked because then when I was in the car, it hit me what the fuck was going to happen now. Because I was in the car and I remember sitting in the back seat with my kids because I actually didn't know if I was going to see them again. Um, because I knew this was big. You know what I mean? Like it was massive. Um, and um, I remember I, I got dropped off at Bearwood Police Station. And I tried to open the door and I, I couldn't get out because I just seen my kids, if I'm going to see it again, I eventually got out and I walked and I didn't look back. You know what I mean? I couldn't. And um, yeah, then I just, I just handed myself in to um, Bill Police Station and, and yeah, it was like they just won the fucking lotto. Like all the, all the coppers, as soon as they knew, I just, I entered the fucking doors. It was like, you know, they all came to greet me like fucking... I just, you know, they won the lotto and I just, yeah. It was, the, it was the worst feeling because now I was in there, I just didn't know. This is what the cops have been waiting for for years to get me on something. And now they had, um, you know, they put me in a cell. I remember um, I, I had to sit in a cell. It was just like under four hours I was there for. And the cop who was in the, in the cell area, 
when, when all the coppers went out the room, he turned around to me and he goes, I'm going to leave the door open for you, all right, Neil? And I said, yeah, that's fine, bro. And he just goes, I read your book. I said, it's fucking good, man. And I said, bro, I said, man, you've read my book? I'll sign it for you if you let me go. <laughs> and um, he just, he, he laughed and then, but it was, you know, I was just trying to keep my spirits up because I, I, I really was just looking at the floor and just all I could think about was like, what the fuck's gonna happen now? You know what I mean? I, if I'm going inside, you know, is this gold for, for all the people who are waiting for me who I've fucking had, you know, uh, biffs with, you know, over the years, are they gonna be waiting now for me? I remember that they, the coppers came and got me from the cell to take me downstairs to the, the holding cells downstairs in the court. And um, I walked down and I thought, this is it now. Am I going to get bail? If I don't get bail, where, where am I going to be held? And um, I had to wait downstairs for another, I think it was close to three hours downstairs. And before I got, like, as I was going into the cell, you know, they make you undress, get naked and all like that. And I don't know if he knew me or whatever. He was just this fucking... Um, this fucking prison officer kind of guy, he just fucking grabbed my clothes and he threw them out the fucking cell and he always go and get them. And I went, bro, I'm not gonna walk out there. There's people out there. And he just goes, go and get the fucking, go, go and get your clothes, otherwise you'll sit there fucking naked. And I walked out and I just remember, he, he was just like a fucking idiot to me. And I thought, that was going for my, is this it now? You know what I mean? Is this how I'm gonna be treated? They all know who I was. They didn't ask if I was affiliated with anyone, they just put me in any cell and they, um, and then I think it was just over three hours, my solicitor got to see me. I told him what happened. And luckily for me, I got bail. You know what I mean? And um, it took what, over three and a half years for the court case to be finalized. And it was all right. As I said, I, I you know, I, yeah, I got a few little charges, but uh, I, you know, I got away with it in the end. They had not, really, they had nothing on me. So what happened is um, I actually went, I was doing a bit of um, debt collecting at the time. And uh, someone rang me up saying that, you know, they were going to lose their house. They were going to lose, the, um, the father was going to lose everything. Could I help them get their money back? And I said, well, bro, if, if you've got documents, I'll help you. And he goes, I've got everything he would need. So he's owed, I think it was $600,000 he was owed. And uh, this guy was a con artist, you know what I mean? I'd done a bit of homework on him. Apparently he'd already ripped off Mick Garrow. Uh, I think Mick Garrow was uh, owed 60000 or something from him. And, um, and his, he ripped off his ex-wife down in Wollongong by 200 grand. So I'd done a bit of homework. Apparently what he did, what he used to open up a lot of um, fake offices, pretend he was, because he was a broker apparently, open them up and close them down. So then they, we got wind that he was in uh, Coffs Harbour. So I, I said to the guy who, who got me, like it was his father who put the money in and his father's mate. I said, mate, if you want me to go, you drive me down to Coffs Harbour, we'll sort it out. I'll, I'll see if I can get what we can do, sort out an arrangement or get some of your money back. So I went down there, um, everything was sweet. Um, I seen the guy, I was sitting down with him. I didn't lie to him, I told him who I was. You know what I mean? I thought, bro, you wanna know who I was? Go and Google me. I'm, I'm here, I'm the real deal, I'm coming down. You know what I mean? I'm no fake shit. I just wanna sort this out, go home, and there's no dramas. And he, we were talking nicely, but the fucking prick who went with me, whose father was owed the money and his father's mate was owed the money, went to the ATM without my fucking authority, and tell him to get fucking cash out for him. He says, I want cash. Didn't tell me. And then I only got to know about this after um, the police told me when I when they were looking for me after, because he rang the police after this, because he said he got robbed, right? And because I told him who I was, it wasn't hard to fucking find me, because you know what I mean? I wasn't being fucking hard. So um, when I went to the police station, St. Mary's police station for this, um, at the, the first time, um, they sat me down and they said, I said, why am I here? Like, what, what have I done? I've done nothing wrong. All, all they had me on was that I didn't have um, a debt collector's um, license. That's all they had. And I said, well, so fucking find me for doing that big deal. And he goes, no, you took money from him. I said, bro, I didn't take no other money. When I found out how much I took money, I said to him, I think it was like six, 700 bucks. I said, do I look like I need 700 bucks? I said, seriously, like, you know, I've just got a book out. I'm do, I do this, do that. Do I look like I'm gonna take 700 bucks off somebody? And apparently this is what happened. This is very funny what happened. The dickhead who took the money off him took 700 bucks off him, but gave him $50 back to get petrol home. What the fuck? I said, would I do that? I don't fucking think so. And that's, that's what it was all over. And the thing is, I was used as a guinea pig, really, to find all these other Australia's most wanted people. You know, they put someone who's got high profile, that means they'll get the attention that they need, and it was good for them. And they apparently they, they found out of the 20 people, 16 of the people, you know what I mean? So they used me, but the thing what, what pissed me off was they used me as a guinea pig with pedophiles and murderers. 
You know what I mean? And telling everyone, don't go near me uh, because I'm this, this, and this. But I, I was doing personal training, you know, just down the road from here. You know what I mean? It's, I was on social media. They couldn't find me for four and a half years. How the fuck can you not find someone who's on social media? Mentally, it, it, it fucked me up because for three and a half years, um, going to court in Coffs Harbour, and then they, they put it down to Penrith, not knowing what I'm going to get, you know, like, seriously, like, they, they wanted something on me. You know what I mean? And I actually thought I was going away for seven years. That's it. I'm going away. Every day I had with my kids was, I felt like it was the last. Um, I talked to myself a lot. I, I go for walks. I wanted a long time. Um, you know, I, 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 I've been in holes before, you know what I mean? But this was, this was a hole that I couldn't get out of because I had no control over it. Um, and as I said, you know, when it came to the day when I, I was getting my sentence like that, I just remember, you know, this is it, you know what I mean? And I, I must have lost so much weight from it because I just didn't want to train, didn't want to eat. And um, I, I just remember at, at that point when I, I got away with it and they, I didn't go to jail for it, I vowed never to help anyone again like that, you know what I mean? I would never go out my fucking way, uh, I, not even for fucking family, you know what I mean? Because look at what it got me. I, I don't want to lose my fucking kids, you know what I mean? Because they're everything to me. So yeah, it, it mentally fucked me. For more than that, it fucked my kid. Like, because at the moment, and I, this is the truth, he's still getting over it. He got anxiety from it. Like he's seen what, everything from the news to everything. When he went to school, um, from me being on TV and getting arrested, he was approached by teachers. Um, he was approached by uh, parents. They were told not to play with him. You know what I mean? Because of, you know, just because of who I was, they, they, they scourged him. And um, so we had to get him out of the school, take him to another school. He lost a lot of friends over it. He didn't, he couldn't accept it. You know what I mean? And he's still getting over it. You know what I mean? But now he's, he's, he's fine with it. He knows, because he knows now my life. Back then he didn't understand. But um, that, that's what really hurt me the most, seeing, seeing my son go through what he did. I sat down and I thought, I want to get out of Sydney. Because if I didn't get out of Sydney, um, I, was, I knew that I'd, I'd go back into the scene. So I tried to move away. I went to Cronulla for a bit and it wasn't further enough for me. I was still fucking seeing people. Um, and I virtually just went, you know what? I'm just gonna kind of go pick somewhere on the map and I'm going for it. That's it. And that's where I'm just gonna go for 12 months, six months and see what happens. I ended up going to fucking a place by Bathurst called Cara. All right. Uh, I'd never heard of the fucking place in, in my life. Went there. Um, country town, no one knew me. And um, I opened up a couple of businesses, juice bar and all like that, and a wholesale kind of uh, veggie place for everyone, all the restaurants to come and get. I was killing it, loving it. And then all of a sudden, one Tuesday night, I remember it, I was on fucking TV on, t on um, the news, Channel 7 News. My face was put on there again for the Abrahams. And I just went, oh my God, Please tell me this country town don't watch this fucking show. And the next day, no one turned up at my fucking business, bro. Like I'm, when I'm saying that, I just went, what the fuck's going on? And then the next day, no one come. The next day and the next day. I used to get the coppers coming to get their lunches from my juice bar and all like that. No one was coming. And then uh, someone told me on the restaurant, this guy, this kid, he was from uh, Canberra and he moved to here and he just goes, hey, Neil, I just, uh, just want to come and tell you that they're having a meeting um, next week to try and kick you out of town. I said, what? I said, this is not the fucking, like, uh, like it's not the West, you know, the Cowboys and Indians here. He said, yeah, they're gonna try and kick you out of town. And th then they started, I found out, he said, if you go to this shop and this shop, you'll see that they put uh, cutouts of the newspaper on the back of the counters, not to shop um, at your shop and to say, I said, are you serious? And they said, yeah. So I went around, they seen it all, I told these people to get them off, I, fuck, and I was losing it. And then all of a sudden my kids got spat on in the street and I just, this is fucked, you know, I couldn't take it no more. Um, I was, like, I've, I came down here to just get away from shit and for a country town just to turn on me, like they did, you know what I mean? The coppers started pulling me over for no reason. Um, no one was coming to my shop. I had to take my kids out of the school again. You know what I mean? It's just like, this is not happening. I, I just got rid of my business for any price I could to get out of there. And uh, that to me was just like something out of a movie. You know what I mean? Um, so that's basically, you know, aftermath of, that's what's followed me around virtually. I'd say it's calmed down now, but 
when I when I was with John and when I left John and then when I became Australia's Most Wanted, to to have that on you all the time, you know what I mean? I, I just like to be sometimes people just come up to me and go, hey Neil, how, how are you? What's your name? What do you do? You know what I mean? But it never happens, you know what I mean? So I, I came back to Sydney and I just, you know, that's basically, um, I, I needed to, I, I, I thought to go back, I did, I must admit that. Um, but then I just went, you know what, I'm not, I didn't, I went on personal training. Um, I got myself back into, uh, uh, in a way where, instead of doing it for other people, I now had to do things just for me. You know what I mean? It was about Neil now. Because all, all my life it's been about making sure you're okay, are you okay. Never fucking thinking about is Neil okay. And then I just went, you know what? Um, I've got to start focusing on me. So I went to the gym. Um, I started doing things myself. I started reading a lot of books. Um, and then, yeah, I just, I had to, it was hard. You know what I mean? But then I must admit, I, I hit the gear. And that gear helped me. It's, people might say, fuck, what, what, how did it help you? But it did because it calmed me down. And it, because I could see that I was, I, was, I was building something that I wanted to build for me, it, it was a goal in a sense, you know what I mean? So if, if anything, yeah, it, that helped me. Not having a family and for someone to just disown you like it is, a mother especially to just disown me um, because of what I'm doing, um, you know, that was hard for me. And then, you know, it like, and then my sisters, you know, don't want to know me, but they're dropping my name to get jobs. You know what I mean? Like it's, that's the only thing that I, um, upsets me a lot and all, all that, but with everything else um, that I've been through, as I said, when you're in the moment, it doesn't, you don't see it. As I said, like yeah, all the stuff I've been through with John, I, I I never went home that day and go, oh fuck, I've just been in drive-by shit. You know what I mean? I went home, it was just another day in the office for me. You know what I mean? That, that's how it was. Um, but. Other things hurt me more than anything, you know what I mean? Like, uh, with the mental health kind of stuff, you know what I mean? I was, I'd go into a park and talk to myself, um, you know what I mean? I've put a hit on myself before, you know what I mean? And um, and that's when I think I've been at my lowest, um, when the gang wars were going on. I was going through a bad relationship. Um, I wanted out. I was losing mates a lot. They didn't want to talk to me anymore. I only had, you know, I kept a handful around me and I had no family around me. Uh, so I don't want to talk to. And my dad disowned me because he found out who I was with too from back in the UK. And um, so it got to the point where, well, what the fuck's point of me being here then? So I remember asking someone who, who I knew done things like they did. I told him it wasn't me who I wanted them to get. It was somebody who, um, who I had a biff with, but I needed something doing to him. But uh, it was me that he was doing the hit on. And it was just, I don't know, to this day, you know, I still I still don't know why he knew it was me. I don't know, maybe it's the way I stand, maybe it's the way I fucking sit, I don't know. But um, he seen me in the park where I said the guy would be, but it was gonna be me. And then um, he walked over and smacked me in the face and told me never to fucking do this again. And, um, he actually smacked me twice in the face, actually. And I've, but um, yeah, that was, that night I was ready for it. You know, I had my hoodie on. Um, I was supposed to be at work at the cross, but I didn't go and I was waiting for the shot at the back of my head. You know what I mean? I was, that was, that's probably one of the saddest moments of my life, sitting in a park waiting to be shot. Uh, after that, it's probably because I went and spoke to people, I actually opened up, like, you know what I mean? Like there was two people I used to speak to a lot. One was an ex-soccer player and I used to speak to him and he used to tell me like, Neil, you gotta kind of get out, think out of the square. You know what I mean? You're, you're always, jump out and see what's going on. You know what I mean? Because you're not, you, you, you're kind of like, yeah, 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 you'll be all right. But you're not, man, I can see you're not. And um, he stood around me for a long time and uh, made sure I was all right. He'd come out of his way, talk to me, instead of me talking to myself. Because when I talk to myself, you don't get the right answer. You just, you want to, you get the answer coming out that you just really want to hear, but it's not the right one. And um, yeah, he would, I would talk to him even though it bored him and he would give me the answers back and then I would go away and fix, try and fix the problem. You know what I mean? But um, besides that, yeah, that was, that was hard. My biggest life lesson would be, don't trust people. Um, don't, it's maybe family, friends, that's my biggest thing now is, is I trusted too many people. And then um, people use me 
for the fact of who I was. That is my only life lesson, and I, I still I still think about it to this day that I let too many people into my life. I trusted them. They used and abused me, and when they needed what they got, they kicked you know what I mean. They kicked me to the side, and it's still happening now. And that goes from celebrities too. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's my biggest life lesson. My biggest inspiration are my kids. Without my kids, I wouldn't be here. Without my kids, I'd, I'd still be there, or be locked up, or I'd be dead. You know what I mean? I look at my kids every day and they inspire me to fucking, I want to be here to see them, you know, if they're going to become soccer players or whatever they grow up. You know what I mean? If if I didn't have them, then I know I probably would have committed suicide by now. That's 100%. My biggest advice to, their, to kids these days is, it's not all what it is on the movies and the TV shows and the papers. Um, you know what? They, they go around with their fucking big, uh, thick chains, gold, money coming out of their pockets riding their bikes, driving their big cars. But at the end of the day, you're just a number. At the end of the day, you know, you get the flick that someone else can come and take your take your place. And they said, you know, you need to be there for you. You know what I mean? Is this your goal in life? Because if it's not, it's not for you. You know what I mean? Like, why do you want to be a gangster for? You know what I mean? It's, I never thought one day I'd ever be what I was. But, um, it went down that path and now I look back and I, I can put my hand up and say, yep, I was just a number. And I did, look at me now, I've, I've been replaced. You know what I mean? I've been forgotten even probably. And um, you know, some of the people that I've been friendly with now are six foot under. What's the point? So uh, my biggest advice to people, uh, like young people coming through now is, think about it before you do. You know what I mean? If you've got, if you've got a, um, a goal in life, go at your goal, not someone else's goal. You know what I mean? 2023, I want to go into schools, talk to, you know, um, teenagers about gangs, about their life, mental health. Not just about, like, if they've been enticed to go to gangs, but, you know, if they're having problems at home, even not listening to, their parents aren't listening to them, or they're getting bullied, you know what I mean, in school. Um, I was bullied in school, and it wasn't a fucking good thing, you know what I mean, because you have no one to speak to. Um, and I just want to go in there and, you know, sit with them, uh, talk to them, help them if I can, even, you know, if they want to do things... A weekend and we do a, a weekend um, get together. I, I just want to, I've seen so many kids go down this path and they think it's all great and they end up behind cells or they end up dead. And it's, as I said, and it's the ones, the families and the sisters and the, and the, the brothers who are left behind picking up the pieces. You know what I mean? So if I can help one person, then I've done my job. You know what I mean? So I'm a, I, I can't wait to get into that and do it.